You are watching The Remnant Radio, a crowd-funded show where we interview pastors, teachers, historians, and theologians from different churches and denominations. My name is Joshua Lewis, and this is my co-host, Michael Roundtree. Together, we want to help you break outside of your theological echo chambers. If you're interested in learning about history, theology, or the gifts of the Spirit, this is the show for you. Hey guys, thank you so much for tuning into this episode of Remnant Radio. We're here in the International House of Prayer. Uh, because of this, there's going to be music playing, uh, people praying, and uh, yeah, if there's noise, that's what it is. So uh, we're but it's here. Where we could find Francis? <laughs> in in where Francis goes, we follow. So uh, Francis, yes. you know, tell us a little about yourself and your ministry before we dive into our conversation oh, today. Oh gosh, um, I don't even know how to describe myself anymore. Praise uh, God. Yes, I I. <laughs> I can say I love Jesus so much. I'm so expectant. I'm looking at the scriptures differently, you know, just with fresh eyes. Recently, Second Corinthians 3 has really hit me with, you know, when he talks about Moses and the glory that fades compared to the glory we can have now. And I'm just going, God, I mm. want this. Like, it's supposed to surpass, far surpass yes. mm. the glory of Moses. Oh, yeah. And so I, I've got to believe it because it's the word of God. Mm -hmm. And yet we look in Moses' life and we're going, that's outrageous the things he got to experience. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And we're supposed to far surpass that. And so I'm just on a journey now where I'm going, no, God, this is your word. Mm -hmm. I still look up to Moses like, oh, I wish I could get a fraction of what he had. And... So I don't even know how to describe what I'm doing ministry wise or anything else. Just I am someone that is believing what the word of God says and saying, I want this so bad. Praise God. Amen. Yeah. Is Elijah really jealous of us? Yeah. Yeah. Is he? Yeah. You know? Right. Yeah. Yeah. Well, uh, so speaking of that journey, yeah. what we really want to talk about today is the sacraments, because I know that's been part of the journey. Mm -hmm. And we've heard you make some statements publicly <laughs> about the sacraments. You're laughing because I know you got some pushback. I mean, yes. can you imagine Francis Chan getting some pushback on something? <laughs> <laughs> on anything. Yeah, yeah, on anything you could say. Yes. You could be like, the sky is blue. I know. Sometimes it's pink. Yes. <laughs> you yes. Know? yes. So... So talk to us about your journey with the sacraments, maybe where you started and yeah. just where God has brought you along. And oh, we'll jump into some gosh. of the scriptures too. Yeah. I, and, and I'm good. I am good with uh, any pushback, feedback, sure, anti-Francis sure. podcast. <laughs> so even if this is one, it's, it's whatever. It's, it's the Lord's will. will. Yeah. Okay. But on some of these issues that are so sacred... Mm -hmm. such as the sacraments. I mean, in its name, it, this is sacred. Mm -hmm. And I have not held the sacred. So number one, I need to confess. I have repented. God, I did not take this seriously. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, I grew up, you know, we'd play with the communion cups, stick our tongues in them. And, mm -hmm. you know, just like, it, it's just, it's a thing we do. It's just a symbol I was challenged a few years ago to study the early church. Mm -hmm. um, like, I said, all your church history is from the last 500 years. Mm. Do you even know what happened during those first 300? Do you even know what their gatherings were like? Because they didn't preach 40 minute sermons mm. expository from the New Testament. What did they do? They didn't have the same worship bands. And that, what did they do? And, I just began to study, mm. and when I saw the centrality of the Eucharist, along with studying the scriptures, and I'm looking at some of the things Paul says in 1 Corinthians 10 and 11, and I'm going, Lord, this is scary. I am so sorry. I have missed this. Mm -hmm. And it just sent me on this journey to study more and more of the scriptures, of church history. Um, and I began to question, like, why did I believe what I believed mm -hmm. about the sacrament? Why did I think it was just a symbol that you take once a month or, mm -hmm. you, you know, whatever? And uh, and I realized, because it's what I was taught. Mm -hmm. right. I never really studied church history, especially early church history. I mean, really, it's the first 
1500 years of church history yeah. where communion, the, the Eucharist was always at the center and everyone believed, everyone believed in the real presence of Christ yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. in that bread and cup. Somehow, in some form, yeah. you know, no one saw it as a symbol. Yeah. Occasionally there'd be a heretic that we brought, but you even see the early church fathers confront that heresy. Yeah. And I didn't know this, that it wasn't until 500 years ago. Good old Zwingli. Yes, Ulrich Zwingli that says, oh, it's just a symbol. And he moves the Eucharist from the center of the church and puts his pulpit there. And the, the, the one thing that was supposed to bring us together, all of us staring at the body and blood of Christ, that being the central part of our gatherings, this being what the early church devoted themselves to, the apostles' mm. teaching, you know, the prayer, yeah. the breaking of the bread and the prayers, the mm -hmm. fellowship. It's, and I didn't know this stuff. And I'm looking mm. and going, God, I am so sorry. I'm looking at the scriptures and Paul's saying, you better examine yourself. Yeah. And you better recognize, this is why many of you are weak and sick and some of you have died. Why do we not warn people? Come on. How many times have I led gatherings and not warned people, this could kill you. It's the only such warning like this in the New yeah. Testament. This is the Holy of Holies of the New Testament. It's you don't just yeah. walk in there. Absolutely. Yeah. And now I'm just like, this has to be the center. And so even getting ready for this big gathering that yeah. we're going to have, we were just talking about this half an hour ago. Wow. We just, the Lord led us towards this as leaders mm. and we partook together and, Praise God. and we just said, look, these gatherings all about, oh, if this guy nails his message and this band sings this song, you know, then we're going to usher in the presence of Christ. Now, Scripture already tells us how to usher in the presence of Christ. Mm -hmm. You bring break in the, the ark. Bread. Yeah. Break the bread. Yeah. You know? That's it. Uh, okay, so, let, me, let me define terms. I know you've got a question. Oh we, we talked about Eucharist. We said the table. We said the sacraments. All these things. When we say sacraments... Most in the kind of Protestant space will go, um, uh, you know, communion and baptism. Yes. Uh, outside of that uh, very narrow tradition, there are others that will go, you know, there are maybe foot washing they'll add into a sacrament. Mm -hmm. there, there are some anointing marriage the anointing, I think, with, mm -hmm. with some of the uh, older Christian traditions within Roman Catholicism mm -hmm. and maybe even Eastern Orthodox. So when we say sacrament, for the purpose of our discussion, and, and even you might add into that sacrament, I think we'll keep it to communion and and baptism right. yeah for the sake of the discussion eucharist is just another word for communion for many evangelicals who use that term and then uh the table also communion we're not trying yeah. to confuse yeah, people with terms good. and we, we've actually done an episode on remnant radio before about is anointing of the sick a sacrament sure. we walk through mm. it's actually i'm kind of inclined to think it might I, be. i'm inclined to think it is but yeah. um neither here nor there one of the things that you said francis was that throughout church history the church has held to, quote, some form of mm. real presence. And so yes. I'd like to explore that because, yeah. you know, people people saw you hobnobbing with the Pope and they're like, yeah, ah, yeah, Francis yeah. is a Roman yeah. Catholic now. And yeah. He believes yeah. in transubstantiation. Yes. But yes. I think a lot of evangelicals yes. um, don't realize the variety of views yes. of yes. communion, where transubstantiation is yes. one view, where it's, yes. it's, you know, trans change, substantiation, so that... The, the elements actually change the into the body and yeah. the, the substance of it changes into the body and blood and that uh, just sort of like on the surface, yeah. it's, it kind of tastes like bread and wine. Okay, yes. that's one view, but Lutherans too hold to, uh, they'll, they'll hold to the sacramental union mm. that the presence of Christ is sort of, uh, I think the language is above, above around and in or under, something like that. And so trying to articulate yes. where is this presence of Christ in the body and the blood yep. and then... Uh, and then there is consubstantiation, which is typically just slightly differentiated. The but Lutherans almost don't the like it when that. you call it that. No, though. they don't. They, they very much they're not, yeah. union. <laughs> uh, but consubstantiation basically just kind of affirms both. It, yeah. it is bread and wine. It is body and blood. And we just kind of mm. don't get how. 
Yes. And then uh, and and then you have what am I missing here? Uh, the Luther's view. Uh, of, yeah, we talked the, about that. No, Calvin's view. Calvin's where, view, where it's like there is, which is my. View. We go up. Yeah. He doesn't come down. We go up. Right. Yeah. Right. But it's uh, but the real emphasis is on the Holy Spirit making Christ imminent, present yeah. with us. Yeah. Okay. And then of course there's the memorial view of Zwingli, mm-hmm. which uh, wedding ring. Yeah. The just wedding. A ring. It's, it's just a symbol. So. Yeah. That was like a super fast yes, right yes, there. Yes, yes. But uh, so Francis, I not not that you even necessarily know where you fall. Yeah. But where do you find yourself leaning in mm. that spectrum? Yeah. I, I mean, I would lean back to the first thousand years. I know maybe some people listening don't know that there was one church for mm-hmm. a thousand years, right. and it wasn't until the ten fifty four mm-hmm. that the Great Schism, schism. happened. Yeah. Now you've got an Eastern Church and a Western Church, and um, but before that. There was one church and they didn't really define it uh, super intricately. They never called it transubstantiation. They just referred to this is the body of Christ. Yeah. This is my body broken for you. This is, there is a real presence here. They didn't try to over define it. It wasn't until, um, you know, the Protestant Bishop of era. Rome yeah, yeah. Um, really broke off. And then uh, in the Roman Catholic Church yeah, yeah. is when the uh, in the West the transubstantiation, I believe, really came on the heels of uh, or alongside of that Enlightenment period. Mm-hmm. Trying to hyper define everything. Yes, we can define, mm-hmm. and it's no longer this mystery that it had been for a thousand years. Mm-hmm. So for me, I go back to that first thousand years where I'm trying to study and go. My epistemology has changed. Hmm. Uh, my understanding of how to acquire truth. I mean, I came out of seminary going, well, I've got Log- Logos got Bible, Bible software and I go in my office and I can study all these commentaries hmm. in the Greek and the Hebrew and come up with the right uh, answer. And now I'm in my study of scripture, I'm going, well, where's the Holy Spirit? And, and uh, why is am I closer? And how is not truth from God? And then does the church body have anything to do with understanding truth? And I'm That's looking wisdom, at that yeah. first thousand years and going, if there was one council and they all agreed on something, sure. and it's that same truth for those first thousand years, I'm not going to go with my opinion anymore as superior to when the church was one and what they believed for a thousand years. Yeah. So I lean towards, I'm still studying all of that and going, I'm with those guys. So basically you're comfortable with the mystery of yes. it's the body and the blood. It tastes like yes. bread and wine. Yes. I don't know. Yeah. Jesus is here somehow. But yes. something's happening. Yeah. Something real yeah. and it is sacred and yeah. A true blessing. And, you know, looking at scripture when he says, you know, this bread that we bless, is it not a participation in the flesh of Christ, in the body mm-hmm. of Christ? This cup that we bless, is mm-hmm. it is it not a participation, a koinonia mm-hmm. with the blood of Christ? I don't know how to define that I, other than koinonia is koinonia, and somehow I am fellowshipping with the blood of Christ. I don't know how. I don't know what it looks like. But when I pray and I go, oh God, I I want everything, everything, every bit of intimacy this, this flesh and blood human being can have with the flesh and blood of Christ. I can't know how this happens. It is a mystery. I believe it, and I want everything you will give me on this. Because I just want to experience you. I, and I, that last statement, I want to experience mm. you. Earlier, we talked, we were talking in terms of theology. I yes. do want to know about your experience with this. I was raised in a community, you know, God inhabits the praises of his people, Israel, right? So like when we sing and we worship, God inhabits that. So I experienced God in worship because mm. I was trained that that's mm. where I can meet God. And then I was trained to say that his word is living and active. It's breathed out. It's the very breath of God. And yes. when we read it, we hear his word. And, and I experienced God's spirit in preaching but I never experienced it in the table until I had changed my view on communion. Have you experienced the table differently now having changed your position? Yes. (laughs) Yes. It is now. I feel like it's my favorite thing to do. on Yeah. Like to be one with the body because recognizing the body, uh, it could be about the bread and the cup, but it, 
it for sure is about the body. Yeah. That you are a part of the body. You look at the context of first Corinthians 10 through 14. Yeah. He's talking about the body of Christ. He's saying specifically, don't call that the Lord's supper. What you guys are partaking in because one guy's hungry and another guy's drunk. Mm. You're not recognizing the body. You're not, you can't say, I don't need you. You've got to recognize the body. And so, now in recognizing the body and making sure everyone's needs are are taken care of even in our gatherings in my home it's like yeah. hey let's find out what needs are going on in this room i don't want to take the bread and cup if someone's in a deep need that this body Whoa. can take care of yeah. we need to recognize the importance mm-hmm. of every part because it's a sacred thing we're about to do and then when we gather together in unity recognizing recognizing the body Hmm. around the world and going they're taking of the same bread and cup recognizing the body of christ that has gone before us in heaven and coming into his presence and in unity as that body ah it's it's so different Mm -hmm. It, it i i don't think i'm exaggerating when i say those are my favorite moments now yeah yeah, that's... I, my Lutheran friends go, you know, I don't know if, <laughs> I don't know if God was in that sermon, but he was in the table. <laughs> like, you know, yeah. like, like the, yes. the sermons and they go, I just don't they, know if the Spirit was on the that. fallback oh. of the table, but the Spirit was in the table. I, yes, I just, yes. I, I, I love that. And I, I love what both of you guys said, because I, I think that's what changed for me is that when I went from going to the table as a mere act of obedience, because, well, God says to do it, so I'll do it. Yes. But when I, and I got real honest with myself and it was like, okay, I'm tasting some grape juice. I'm, I'm eating a little wafer. And I'll be like, I, honestly, I don't experience God nearly as much just trying to remember the cross right now as I do when I'm singing about the cross and yes. having this like, in, you know, powerful worship encounter, you know, mm-hmm. and it wasn't until my view shifted on communion and believing in a real presence of Christ. And I believe it's mm-hmm. by the Holy Spirit, real presence, but when the table became maybe my favorite thing, I, I just, I love it so much because I, uh, it's like, it's like I, I'm participating in this messianic banquet. Like Jesus, Jesus gr- goes from the, the cross to not just risen savior, but actually hosting me at a table. Like, like yeah. wait, you're hosting me. What is this? It's, but when you actually come in faith, it makes such a difference. Mm. I see you turning to the passage, so I, I want to just give you the opportunity. <laughs> well, to because it. it's that very thing you're talking about. It's yeah. Luke eight, yeah, and the woman who reached out for Jesus to touch him. Everyone was pressing in on him, and mm. Jesus, someone touched me. But one touch, yeah, and and the disciples are like, "You're crazy! Everyone touch you!" And like, no, 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 no. It's about this woman who is doing exactly what you're talking about mm-hmm. in. Faith, Whoa. she went out and reached. And I oh, really man, believe that's, really that's significant with the really bread good. and the cup. It is about faith. Mm-hmm. It is about reaching for mm-hmm. that bread and that cup and going, God, I believe there's something you've ordained in this. I mean, this is just what I see in scripture. This is what the early church agreed upon. And I am yeah. reaching out in faith. That's why we are now experiencing that's these right. things at the table. Yeah. Just like all those people touched Jesus and nothing happened. Yeah. But yeah. the woman that reached out in faith. I love so, that. So the ark is only built of acacia wood and gold. It's only built. It's just gold. It's yes. just acacia yes. wood. But but Uzzah reaches out, touches <sighs> this thing, gets struck down. <sighs> um, you mentioned 1 Corinthians 10, right? You were, I saw you there earlier before yeah. you flipped to, uh, to Luke. You know, you said people have taken the table and died. And, and I, I've regretted mm. passing the table. Right and and not giving warnings, I've regretted yes. that. Um, speak to that for me. Do you, do you hold because of this very sacred experiential? Do you hold to a closed table? Do you close mm. to open table? Do you warn people? How, yes. how do you how do you personally practice this? When I practice, I warn. Okay. Um, I just I just read from the scripture. A man ought to examine himself before oh, he eats yes. the bread or drinks of the cup. Because anyone who eats or drinks without recognizing the body mm-hmm. of the Lord eats and drinks judgment upon himself. So it's not my examination of him. Like, oh, I'm, no. like someone's in church membership. I'm not, a, as an elder, oh, yeah. I'm not examining you. You're told to examine yourself before God. Yeah, and I understand. Like, I and I'm wrestling with this one. Because <laughs> it's the way I understand uh, 
the early church, it wasn't really an open communion. Sure. You know, it was like they knew these people. Yes. We're living in such a different time and world where we have a thousand different churches in one city. Right. And people can jump Sunday to Sunday. And our understanding of church is so warped that I don't even know what to do anymore. Yeah. Um, because you have these visitors. So all I know to do is to read the word of God and warn because as dangerous, it's dangerous mm -hmm. to administer communion to someone who has not examined themselves. Yeah. But I, I think this is what I'm wrestling with. I think it's a dangerous thing to also tell people you're not welcome to the table. Yeah. And this is what I'm challenging some of my Orthodox and Roman Catholic brothers. Like, I get it. We have to hold this in reverence, yeah. but is there any bit of you that has a, like, to, isn't there any wrestle with saying to me whom you would say, the Holy Spirit is in Francis, mm -hmm. he is the son of God, but he is not welcome mm. to our table. Yes, he's welcome to the Lord's table, yeah. but not ours. I mean, I, I don't want to overstep my bounds. I'm just saying I need to be careful in recognizing the body and mm. not recognizing the body and yeah. ostracizing parts of the body. Yeah, and people who, again, I didn't define my term. When I say closed table, if you don't know what that term is, mm. closed table is just, we reserve mm. the table for people who are members of our church. And that's not to say membership is like, um, you know, these hoops, big hoop, hoops that people go through as much as it is publicly recognized members of the community who have saving faith in Christ Jesus. We go, we know that they, that there is a mutual submission to one another and that they're not under church discipline. They, as far as we know, are in right standing before God. So we're sharing the table freely with these people. Yeah. And, uh, yeah. And when we talk about our, our Roman Catholic, Eastern Orthodox, um, people outside of their uh, denominational sphere is what you're yes. referring to just yes, now. Yes, yes, yeah, yes. Yeah, so yeah. it's not open to anyone yeah, else. If you were a Roman Catholic going to another Roman Catholic church, yes, you then could I'd take be the table. open. Right. You know, I mean, I actually, <laughs> interestingly, I had a talk uh, with um, the guy who plays. Say the Pope and I'll just walk out. No. Okay. <laughs> the guy who played Jesus on The Chosen. Oh, okay. Yeah. Cool. You know, we spent a day together and, and he's Roman Catholic and he actually. Uh, what you call it, but that he can administer oh, the Eucharist. Oh, okay. And so, you know, we had a great conversation, you know, and Jonathan and I are friends now. Mm -hmm. And, and I, I even asked him, like, I just want to know, okay, see that guy sitting at that table. If you were to tell him how to get to heaven, how would you say it? You know, what would you say to him? Yeah. And he lays out the gospel, you know, as yeah. clearly as, as any reformed guy would or whatever, sure. you know, it's just, and, and I go, but you and I can't, you can't, you can't, break bread with me right now it's like no you know which is hard to see it is hard especially when Did it's you jesus on him like come on man <laughs> yeah just, no just no i elements. know i know <laughs> and it's always weird because you know he's playing jesus and i'm jesus saying no i don't know with you and uh <laughs> but interesting but it, 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 it does it really throws your own mind for a loop like <laughs> no he's just a guy jesus, okay just no. a guy. <laughs> but i love him i love him i love him and i'm like okay but I want this and I, you know, there's no way, and this is what I'm saying, there's no way to the, to the Orthodox friends of mine, Roman Catholics or anyone else that keeps me from the table. I go, there's no way you can say you believe that God wants us at separate tables, mm -hmm. that right. this was his desire. Amen. This is what he wanted, yeah. that there'd be 30 different tables, yeah. mutually exclusive. Yeah. You can't look me in the eyes and tell me that when you read the scriptures, when you pray, that's what the spirit tells you, yeah. this is a good thing. So I'm not saying I have an answer, but isn't, let's fight yeah. to yeah. figure out how to get back to one table. Amen. Yeah. Okay, I wanna come back to something you said earlier about the uh, just the way you've begun to see scripture in different eyes and you focused especially on that first thousand years of history mm -hmm. when the church was one before yeah. the great schism. And, uh, and so I want to just, as some of the people who are watching this, they're going to say, well, so, so Francis, he's not sola scriptura anymore. Mm. He's uh, scripture and tradition. And uh, mm. could you speak into that for a moment and, and let us know, what is the role of tradition in interpretation of scripture? Is it like 
is it like scriptures higher up, but tradition helps me interpret? Is mm. it scripture and tradition are tied or tradition even takes the, the like, where does it fall for you? Mm. I, um, and I don't know if it's because of my upbringing or the way I was taught, but I still hold a very, very high view of scriptures. Like that's the only thing I can really trust. Mm-hmm. Now, the problem is I have to trust someone's interpretation when I read it whether that's mine with my computer mm. or it's mine with my elders. Yeah. yeah, mine with, you know, and that's what's difficult is we can say sola scriptura all day, mm-hmm. but then we still have to read it and explain what it means mm-hmm. and yeah. interpret what it means. And I'm just saying, I don't bet on just me anymore. I look at the elders of my church. I go, hey, let's look at this together. But I don't even just bet on the elders of our, my church. I go, let's look at what those early church fathers, let's, you know, that's why we love the Apostles' pre- Creed and the Nicene Creed. It's like they, they were all the church leaders. That was yeah. the council. They all believed. Now, once it's split, can I still believe in the Eastern or the Western? I don't know. Yeah. It's just a little bit less. So, oh, we, 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 Nicene Constant Chalcedonian, Nicene yeah. Constantinople, right? And then, like, would you hold to like, I guess, the Fifth Ecumenical Council would have been before the split, right? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So, like, I mean, how how far through the the creeds? How, how many creeds are you holding <laughs> to? That's what I'm asking. Yeah, <laughs> I know that had nothing to do with. That. I it's do dodgy. not. Yes, so yes. It's not. No, I'll just be right. honest. I don't know all of them. You okay. know that. Yeah, I haven't gotten that far. I think the, the fifth one has got <laughs> like prayers one. to the saints and stuff, and I'm like, ooh, that one's hard for me. And yeah, like, yeah. Well, <laughs> so, so just ask. Just you could yeah, ask. I wasn't ever prepared for that one. No, no, no. We'll move on. We'll move on. Yeah, yeah. So I am impressed by your knowledge, though. I don't have. I, I, I pretend. Okay. okay. I, I wasn't sure which the fifth one was. Yeah, but okay. I, yeah. So yeah, um, you uh, knew I wouldn't. Know, so. No, it's not true. Okay. <laughs> okay. Um, uh, with uh, with uh, the talking about church history, I, I like mm. that paradigm where we go. Um, I'm going to have a humble anthropology. I always mm. say that I think that's really the key in understanding scripture is looking at myself humbly. Uh, because I know that sin has affected my being, I do trust the Spirit to lead me. Mm. Kevin Van Huser wrote a, a great book on biblical authority after Babel, and he's got this line about the grace of God. Sola, sola uh, Scriptura has to be led by sola gratia. We have to have trust in the leading of God's Spirit um, to reveal these things to us. And then I think was it was it uh, C.S. Lewis who talks about like this chronological snobbery where we think that yeah God can speak to me as an individual, but He hasn't mm. and lead me in my interpretation as an individual, mm. but He hasn't led the whole church yes. you know through thousands yes. of years. It, so there is a line there between you know um, deception in the same way that people today are being deceived. Yes. You know, do you ever look at church history? There's not a there's not a uniformity in the church fathers, is there? Yeah. So how do you do? You just look at the vast majority. Do you, how do you how do you suss through that? Well, I, I'm I guess I'm starting with the foundational. What did they all agree upon? Yeah. Um, you know, it, it seems like there's certain things. You know, like with the gospel. Yeah. And but the sacraments are in there. You know, yeah. the the Eucharist is there. Where I'm like, this is unanimity it, mm-hmm. it really is on certain things uh-huh. and that's where i go okay let me hold to that seems like there's some varying opinions on this i'll study that at a later time you know but what did they hold to i want to make sure i'm holding on to that and it is i, I love that phrase whatever phrase it was <laughs> but a, a <laughs> humble you know, anthropology yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, anthropology because i didn't have that yeah um but here's what i came to at one point i thought okay let's say you and i both believe sola scriptura sure but then we interpret this passage differently, differently. yeah who's right yeah is it do we take an iq test yeah and go whose yeah. iq is higher do Fran- we write yeah. down francis who- is right yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah 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 that's right you that's know right. do you do we what take write down test. how much did I'm we pretty stu- sure I'll win yeah, yeah. yeah. or no. how long did you study for what was what's your yeah. work ethic like okay how many hours do you study yeah. you know like what determines the right answer is it a closeness to the holy spirit because yeah. in both of our studies of the scripture we'd go well the natural man doesn't do this by himself that's right it's got to be the spirit one of us so who is more. closer to the spirit yeah. yeah and who is more humble yeah. that god's grace would be upon them and you gotta start weighing this soon you're going 
this is getting silly. Yes. Um, and so everyone and their mother thinks, no, I'm that guy and I've got a correct theology yes. and let me blast everyone who's off from my view. Right. And they never stop to think, why is your view superior to mine? Mm -hmm. And usually it's because it's a theology they were taught and they're yeah. just, they're, they're going, well, because I was taught this in seminary and, or, or whatever it is, or my leader, my, whoever's in my pulpit, because right. the Eucharist isn't in the center, his pulpit is. And so I follow him. And then it's just Dang. all these arguments versus like the humility to go, gosh, it was a time when the church was one. Many of these people gave their lives Come on. for the gospel. When you read the depth of the things that they wrote yeah. and the sacrifices that they made to follow Jesus, I just go, I bet on them way before I bet on Francis Chan right. as an individual and that's with his visible, laptop. The longer you've looked for truth, I mean, we've watched that kind of humility as if there was ever a time. I don't think I've ever seen an unhumble Francis video. Oh my gosh, but, 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 there's plenty. Yeah, we, we all know our own heart more than, than YouTube can let yes, on. But yes. um, I, I do sense that as we've watched you kind of go through this process of going, how do I know what I know what I know? And I can't trust myself because I know I'm deceitfully wicked. You know, like I just, I don't get it. Uh, we've seen, I feel like seen that drive deeper and deeper into humility. So for whatever that's worth yeah. at a 50,000 foot distance, mm. you know, I, I commend you for it. Right. Yeah. I mean, we trust, you think about it. We trust the, that counsel for those first 300 years to actually give us the scriptures. Yeah. Right. Yeah. They're the ones that canonize it. And so we trust them for that. So we're saying the first 300 years, we don't trust you. We trust this one act you did. And then we don't trust anything you did after that. Right. Just, go, that, just for me, sure. my logic, which could be flawed, you know, sure. I'm just going, well, that's pretty illogical to me. Yeah. So I, I want to ask you a question. We're real close to time. We want to yeah. honor your time here. But yeah. it's really the, the interrelationship between word and table. Because you talked about at the beginning how, you know, the, the pulpit was brought front and center. And the Eucharist was kind of put off on the side. Yeah. Some, some are going to push back and, mm -hmm. and they'll say, well, you know, the, most of the Protestant reformers actually really, really valued the table. Yes. and thought it was beautiful and yes. great. Yes. And then prior to the Protestant Reformation, especially in that first thousand years, if we can cut out the Middle Evil, medieval ages a little yeah. bit, um, especially in that first thousand years, the church fathers would say things like, well, the, the, the word and the sacrament... Mm -hmm equally valuable yeah. but the but the sacrament gets uh, it's um it gets its power from the word mm. so to speak mm. so yeah. um which is kind of over and against when it started to become this sort of magical thing where it's mm. like a just magical baptismal waters you're saying yeah. magical even I mean, the phrase mm. hocus pocus right is of, speaking of, of the, the of the elements the where, uh what are the the inauguration you, hocus f um, it's a latin phrase of which they would anoint the the table really yeah. i didn't know that yeah the phrase hocus pocus oh, comes from right, the lot. latin guy saying hey this table is now the body and blood but maybe it does have a higher iq i don't know I, it's not he a might. higher iq <laughs> it's <laughs> for <laughs> sure not he bad. knows interesting it's facts for sure, that, yeah little right. scatoids that are cute so i just kind of want to introduce that and say what do you see as the introduction is, is the interplay oh, of good. word and table because you know can we get to a place where we elevate table so high and word so low that the table loses its yeah, meaning no, you're right is there a partnership here how do you see that absolutely playing out? i mean i think that's what we've been talking about yeah. Yeah. is this partnership and uh it's it's like through the scriptures i've come to believe that i've got to reach for this uh in faith it's, right. it's through the scriptures that i get this and i i'm not even bashing zwingli because he lived in a time when the word of god was put aside mm -hmm. and uh, so his motives may very well have been i want the scriptures they need to be maybe it was central for a bit or whatever but it seems like there was some regret mm -hmm. you know later on in his life for even yeah, doing that true. i'm just more alluding to what has happened since then where yeah. it's not it's even in the room that. yeah That's it's like right. well we got time for communion uh, my sermon went over sorry and oh. it's like ooh, how many times have i done that i am mm. so sorry lord you know because there's some sort of fellowship yeah. Some sort. That's yes. where I get it from. Isn't the Word of God? Yeah. It's not someone telling me this. I'm looking at the Word. I'm going. Wait, what is that word? Participation. Oh, it's koinonia. What does koinonia mean? Oh, intercourse. <laughs> what? I'm just looking at the lexicon. This is yeah, this is yeah, my yeah, reformed. Yeah, yeah. You know, yeah. back you go. Whoa. 
okay, this is serious. Yeah. It's a word of God that makes me go to the table and go, this is say it's a word of God that's telling me this could kill you. Yeah. This isn't tradition that's telling me this. Right. These are the the two big truths to me, yeah. you know, are coming right out of the word of God where I'm like, why doesn't anyone read this passage? Mm-hmm. This is good. We're so afraid of COVID. Who cares? Oh, Communion could kill you. Come on. You know, like, yeah. why don't you warn about that? And, and, and it's, it's, it's like, <laughs> oh, this is crazy that we don't do this is the word of God that that gives me a reverence coming to the table. It's a word of God that gives me an anticipation of what I can fellowship. I Come can on, coin a with the body and blood of Christ. And, and you're going to preach a sermon so long that I don't get the opportunity to fellowship with him. I mean, I, I tell my church, I go, look. If, if, if I was going to preach for 45 minutes right now, but you knew Jesus was next door in the flesh and you could touch him, just touch him and leave. Or you could stay in this room and listen Bro. to the rest of my sermon. What are you going to do? And this is saying there is some sort of koinonia with the body and blood of Jesus. That's what I've come to do. And, and that's why Paul says, okay, when you come together... Man. You better make sure there's no divisions. You better examine yourself. You better recognize the body. And you come and then let's fellowship with him. That gets me excited to gather. Otherwise, I can just listen to a sermon online. I can just listen to you guys' podcast. Or, I mean, you, uh, you'd feel the spirit if you did that. <laughs> not, this kind of, not the same. No, no, but you know what same. I mean? I do. I do. But there was something about gathering yeah. over the body and blood of Christ yeah, that's it. that we have missed out on. And I feel like this is i'm glad my insides is, are doing backflips as you're I, talking no it's i'm real. glad you chose this topic yeah. because i even told people i go i hate the way like once i i had all these convictions about the church you know i went to a smaller sure. and everyone yeah, started yeah, saying yeah. oh francis Who he's cares? the house church guy and i'm like stop calling me that i don't want to be francis the house church guy like that's not even my point you know but then once mm-hmm. i started reading and studying communion i go okay that i don't mind if you, if, I'll be if, the table if guy. I will be communion yeah. guy, yeah. if I am the one that helps put the body and blood back at the center of the church and I Come die on. doing that and they go, Francis was that communion guy. I'll take that. Amen. Yeah. But don't call me house church guy. Amen. You know, this is sacred putting Christ, the body and blood and fellowship with them at the center, getting people to be reverent of going, this could kill me. And yet I am not going to shy away from that table because this is my opportunity Mm. to fellowship like that woman. I'm going to touch him. I am going to koinonia with him. If that's what my life's work is about, oh, Lord, thank you. I'd be honored to be a voice in this conversation. And I didn't even know that's what you guys want to talk about. No, no, it's perfect. So it's perfect. Hey, we're right at time, so we've got to wrap. We love sacraments too. Yeah, I know. It's it's one of our favorite topics. So good. Okay. You know, guys, if you're out there watching right now, Mm. man, get into the study of the table. Even if you're like, hey, I've done nothing but memorialize this thing, Mm. consider praying, consider reading your your word with some fresh eyes, ask the spirit to lead you, read some church history. I think it will bless you. We have loads of content uh, on the sacraments. Content on this subject. Subject and another one coming up on in June with John Mark Hicks. So. Yeah, so we'll link up a playlist for sure. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Absolutely. Excellent, guys. Thank you so much for tuning in. There's links in the description if you want to support. We're entirely crowdfunded. There's links for PayPal if you want to give a one time gift or Patreon if you want to be a regular giver. You get extra content there on Patreon. Francis, thanks for coming. All right. Thanks, guys. Bless you guys. See you guys. Oh, that was good. I'm-